So, we are excited to have Ramblin' Dan, all the way from Connecticut, drove oh, through the geez. blizzard to get up here. Oh, and uh, here we are. Go slow. Just go slow. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Twice as long. Yeah. Um, I'm Judy Byron. I'm the Adult Program Coordinator. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dan. It's my pleasure to just put on programs in general. You can always contact me, Judy with an I, at waterburypubliclibrary.com. And if you have suggestions or ideas or whatever, I'm always open. Um, and I got to know Dan because he called me up about a blues program, but he thought it was Waterbury, Connecticut. By mistake. <laughs> oh, by mistake. And she says yes. And I did. I said yes. Why not? You know, why not? D T C T. It doesn't matter to me. Come on up. <laughs> anyway, so we've been kind of back and forth trying to find a time. The other, the other time he suggested was the night before my son's wedding, and I thought, no, that's not a good time. <laughs> anyway. Um, Dan's been all over the wor world, and he's um, performed for all kinds of groups, including libraries. And he's not just an, an amazing musician, but he is also a teacher. So we're really excited to have this whole kind of breakdown of the blues, what's the history, you know, how do we get here from there, all that good stuff. Um, and I guess that's good enough, because you're going to give us all the details, yeah, right? I will. All right. Thank you. Right. Take it away, Dan. Yeah. So good to be here. Thanks, Judy. And it was so wonderful. Literally, I was calling somebody else, and uh, it was Judy that answered, and we had a nice conversation, and here we are. <laughs> so anyway, glad to be here. Um, so, how did I get into the blues, for God's sake? I'm from central Pennsylvania, the mountains of central Pennsylvania, really, literally a town kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it was kind of close to Penn State. And uh, I was very fortunate when I was about 16 years old, I, I went up to the local music store, a small little place, and there was a grad student from Penn State that was given lessons. 
I didn't want to, actually didn't want to learn how to play the guitar too much because I'd tried it before and I wasn't making much progress, but I walked into the store and there's a guy sitting in the back and he's doing this. And I go, wow, man, that sounds, that sounds cool. What is that? I don't think I'd ever seen anybody finger pick before. This song is called Freight Train. You may have heard it. Peter, Paul, and Mary recorded it. Um, it was written by this woman here. Her name is Elizabeth Cotton. What a wonderful old, uh, what a wonderful lady. I got to meet her when she was 84 years old. And I promised her, I got to spend a little time with her, and I promised her that whenever I played this song, that I would tell the audience about the story of the song. She wrote it when she was 14 years old. She wanted to learn how to play the guitar, and nobody would teach her because she was left-handed. And she didn't know, she, she ended up just turning the guitar, you know, upside down. But she didn't know that you're supposed to change the string so that the heavy string is still on the top. So she ended up playing it like this, and she just invented all her chords and everything. But it was all upside down and backwards, for God's sake. But anyway, she wrote this again when she was 14. And when I die, please bury me deep at the foot of old bleaker street. think to yourself that doesn't sound much like the blues in fact compared to the first song that I played which was a number by the great Jimmy Reed um, and uh, it sounds a lot different doesn't it well this uh, Elizabeth Cotton was originally from Raleigh Durham North Carolina which uh, our, our tech guy that helped me out today uh, lived down there and uh, there was a big scene down there uh, many years ago, and some of the greatest uh, blues players of all time lived in lived in lived in uh, North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham, that area. One of the greats uh, was from Atlanta, but that that region in the southeast called the Piedmont was where a special kind of music grew up. Here are some of the main characters in that scene: Blind Boy Fuller, Blind Blake, Blind Willie McTell was the one that was actually from Atlanta. But in that region, the style of music evolved. And it's got a characteristic of being kind of bouncy and kind of light. A lot of these songs are played in the key of C, which tends to be a kind of a happier key, if you will. The characteristic of the style called Piedmont Blues is that there's an alternating bass with my thumb. Elizabeth Cotton, when she was growing up, these guys were around, and so I'm sure that she got her style from them, just hearing the music and stuff. A lot of these guys used to play out on the street, and it was just real accessible to everybody to, uh, to get an earful of this stuff. Blind Boy Fuller, Blind Blake, Blind Willie McTell, a lot of times they would, uh, nowadays we would probably call it stealing uh, another guy's song. They would maybe change the title play the rest of it the same, that's their original song, right? Or, or just change a couple words. But here's an example. Just about everybody had a song that went to this progression. 
Well, you gotta stop doing what you're doing to me, baby. If you don't, you're gonna run me wild. You gotta stop doing what you're doing to me, baby. I mean just what I say. You got big legs, got a little bit of feet. Something about you, baby, is sweet, sweet, sweet. Stop doing what you're doing to me, baby. If you don't, you're gonna run me wild. Do what you're doing to me, baby. If you don't, you're gonna run me wild. Gotta stop doing what you're doing to me, baby. If you don't, you're gonna run me wild. I'm down on the corner, hard walk, hard G. My gal's up town hollering, who wants me? Stop doing what you're doing to me, baby. If you don't, you're gonna run me wild. I mean, don't you're gonna run me wild. That was Blind Boy Fuller's song. Blind Blake had one that went, went like that, too. Oh, truckin' mama, I think they dead did this song. Truck by blues away. Well, keep on truckin' mama. Truck by blues away. Does that tune sound familiar to you? You can get anything you want. Alice's restaurant. Well, you can get anything you want. Alice's restaurant. It, it's round the back Just a half a mile from the railroad track You can't get anything you want House arrest wrong, I mean House arrest wrong <laughs> One of the big uh, main characters in that scene was this guy. His name was Reverend Gary Davis. Oh, man, what a player. I never actually met him, but I got to see him play live. It was fantastic. He's got that big uh, guitar. It's called a J200. Normally when I'm playing these shows, I bring, I have a guitar just like that that I bring, but I couldn't afford to bring it out in the cold, you know. But uh, anyway, Gary Davis was quite a character. He lived in a Raleigh Durham area, as I mentioned. He ended up moving to New York City and lived in Harlem. And he became a preacher. A lot of these blues guys had an element of gospel music, and some of them were actually ministers, and they played a lot of religious songs, as well as blues and other stuff. But anyway, he moved to New York City, and he would, uh, in Harlem, he had a storefront church, and he would stand out front, play guitar and sing, and when he was singing, he kind of was a screamer, you know, like, ah. kind of a crazy voice. If you get a chance to look him up sometime online, you can, you can tell. But anyway, uh, he would play that uh, gospel stuff, get people to come in the church, and uh, then he would do his preaching. I happened to meet uh, over the years several guys that uh, studied with him, and there's some funny stories that I heard. First of all, the lessons were $5. They had the lessons in, in Brooklyn. He moved to Brooklyn and bought a, a small house with the proceeds from the song, If I Had My Way. And his title was Samson and Delilah, but it's the same song. Peter, Paul, and Mary recorded it. And I guess they made enough money off it. He was able to buy a small house in Brooklyn. So that's where he gave his lessons. And you, if you got a lesson from him, you went to his house, paid him $5. The lesson lasted all day and included lunch. So he would be down in the basement playing his guitar, and his method of teaching was kind of uh, kind of different. He was blind, and so he would sit in his chair and just play this complicated music that he was uh, known for, uh, just over and over and over and over. And you could just play it a thousand times, and you just watch him, and little by little you would get it, you know. But that was how he taught. But the story was that sometimes he would actually fall asleep <laughs> during the lesson. And uh, you'd have to wait for him to wake up. But, uh, and occasionally his wife would come down with lunch, right? Well, he, he loved the blues and he was quite a character. You can, you can see in this next picture, he's smoking a big old cigar there. I guess that's kind of unusual for a preacher, not sure. But anyway. be playing blues like this one for instance. I'm standing on the corner with a dollar by hand. 
I'm looking for the first woman, I'm looking for a man. I say, how long will I have to wait? Well, can I get you now, baby? Or must I hesitate? Well, a nickel is a nickel and a dime is a dime. I got a house full of children, not one of them mine. I say, how long? How long will I have to wait? Can I get you now, baby? Or must I hesitate? Well, now the eagle on the dollar said, God we trust. Woman, what a man, but you want to see that dollar first. I said, how long? How long will I have to wait? Well, can I get you now? Or must I hesitate? Oh. Davis is coming down with lunch. <laughs> Better get to a gospel song. Oh, glory, how happy I am. He would change when she was around. Oh, glory, how happy I am when Jesus walked in the promised land. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, glory, how happy I am. Oh, glory, how happy I am when Jesus walked in the promised land. Back to the blues. <laughs> I said, now how long? How long will I have to wait? Can I get you now, baby? Or must I hesitate? Can I get you now, baby? Or must I hesitate? Thank you. Well, that's the kind of music that evolved in the Southeast is I, that kind of happy, bouncy kind of sound. Back in, in those days, of course, there was, they didn't have the accessibility to transportation, communication, all the things that we have now. So when something grew up in a certain area, it tended to kind of be there, you know, the styles were kind of regional and they didn't, at first anyway, didn't kind of cross over too much. So there's a whole region here in Mississippi. We're going to head over there. I'm actually doing a tour to Mississippi in April. Really looking forward to that. But anyway, here's Mississippi. And it was a whole different style that, that kind of evolved down there. If you look at this map, you can see this area here where the Mississippi River would flood and it was real flat. That's the area that's called the Mississippi Delta, believe it or not. I would have think the Delta would be down here at the end, you know, like that's what it typically would be. But that's what they call that, the region, the Delta, that often would flood. And that's one of the reasons there was such great soil there for agriculture, big, big uh, area for farming and stuff. And this area up north was called the Hill Country. And even in just Mississippi, there, there grew up different styles that were pretty distinct. Um, back in the old days, the original days, um, they played prim primitive instruments that were mostly handmade. Uh, this is a one string instrument called a diddly bow. Let's see here, I'm gonna switch guitars. The original diddly bows are the most primitive form anyway. They would take a piece of baling wire or they would take a broom and un unwind the, that wire that's around the bottom of a, those old style brooms and make a guitar string out of it and they would nail it on the side of a porch, you know, kind of similar to this, and they would play it with a slide. Of course, you can't fret that, right? So they would get some kind of slide. I'm using a three quarter inch socket wrench. I got a funny story, I was playing up in Maine, and you know, there's all kinds of things you can use for slides, but I was playing in Portland, Maine, and uh, I heard that for the first time, someone told me, uh, you can use a socket wrench, I never thought about it. There's a famous uh, blues artist called John Hammond Jr. that played with a socket wrench, right? 
So I immediately went right out to the local Sears store and I walked in and a fellow said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I need a socket wrench, just one. And he said, what size? And I said, well, I don't know, I have to try a few on. <laughs> so I go over to the socket wrench section and I'm trying, he's putting these things on my finger, you know, he's looking at me. And I never told him what I was doing and we got, we got back to the cash register. I picked up, you know, I paid for it and he said, he said, well, you know, if you ever break that, you can bring it back, you get a new one for free. <laughs> I haven't broken one yet, but I keep losing them. diddly bow. I got another one here that I made myself. This is a one string. It's made out of a candy tin. My daughter uh, went to Paris on a high school uh, French trip, right? And as a gift, she brought me home this can tin of candies from Maxims of Paris, a famous chocolate store, I guess. And so I thought, man, that would make a beautiful diddly bow. You should, you should look at this up close after the show. You can come and look at all my instruments, but it's got quite different sound. because I always get one of two responses consistently. Some of the people say, um, wow, how do you get so much music out of just one string? It's amazing. 
And the other people say, wow, it's only one string. Even I could do that. <laughs> Maybe. Well, it's actually very simple to play. I've done workshops even with kids. I'll show you some slides later. That, uh, I mean, really, I could teach any, any of you guys. And this one, too, could teach any of you in about 10 minutes how to do it. But uh, This is a what I call a cigar box guitar, although I made this one out of a peppermint bark candy tin. <laughs> My wife likes to shop in uh, those kind of junk stores, you know, that are, she calls it shabby chic or whatever. And, uh, and she finds me all these crazy uh, tins and boxes and things like that and I make guitars out of them. <laughs> music from the Delta was basically the roots of rock and roll, pretty much. In fact, this next song that I'm going to play was played on the stage of Woodstock by the band from the 60s called Canned Heat. Remember those guys? my mama, please don't you cry no more. Take a tip from my mama, please don't you cry no more. I'm out on the road. cigar box guitar. Um, the diddly bow and the cigar box guitar were common in the, in the South at that time, and the diddly bow especially was uh, kind of thought as a kid's toy, you know? B.B. King, Muddy Waters, a lot of those guys uh, say that they learned how to play the blues on a cigar box guitar or a diddly bow. 
the guys that uh, that played back in those those days uh, played in kind of places like this. They called them barrel houses. Wait, back. Well, anyway, uh, yeah, they called them barrel houses. They were pretty rough places. I mean, a lot of these guys in this time were sharecroppers. Uh, it was just kind of one small step above slavery. It was still a very oppressive system, and a lot of them just, you know, they never lived outside of their plantation or their immediate area. Like I said before, the transportation was very few real roads or, uh, or anything like that. Uh, one way to get around was on the train, but you had to have money to do that, number one, and there weren't too many trains either. So anyway, um, they would work all week and working really hard, and then Saturday night would be the night where they would go out to the barrel houses and they'd drink a little homemade whiskey, a little moonshine, stuff like that. Maybe there would be a guy coming around with a guitar. They would, they would all dance and get crazy. And uh, the guys around at the time, at that time, were some of these guys. Willie Brown, uh, Charlie Patton, Sun House. They were the original guys that were playing what we now call the Delta Blues. And this is, happens to be a guitar called a resophonic guitar. It's made out of metal. You see the picture of Sun House there. He's got a steel guitar. The first ones were made back in the 20, 1928, I think, was the, uh, the first ones that were made. Um, you may have heard of the term dobro. Well, the people, or the guys that invented the guitar in the beginning, the, the steel guitar, were the Dopiera brothers. And they eventually sold the name of the company or whatever that became National. So National Steel Guitars are well known by, mis uh, by musicians, but they're made out of metal. And they have a, a aluminum cone inside that makes that funky sound. And they, they have cover plates on the top. I got this guitar uh, in Maine, actually, but it was made by a guy from Colorado named Larry Pagribra who was a kind of a genius inventor and a sculptor. Um, and this is a kind of a one-of-a-kind guitar, as you can tell. This is a 1953 Rambler, apparently, appropriately enough, hubcap. See the insignia on it? I thought, when I first got it, I thought it was a Thunderbird, right? Maybe. So I never did really know, and people were always asking me, what kind of hubcap is it? And I said, well, I think it's a Thunderbird. Well, I was playing up in Maine, and I was way out in some back road, way up in the woods in Maine, and I passed this uh, place, I think every state's got a few of these, trailer, mobile home, out, out in the uh, middle of nowhere, and there's like 10,000 hubcaps on, you know, on the wall. I saw one of those places, and I turned around right in the middle of the road, there was nobody around, came back, and I thought, now these guys will maybe be able to identify this for me, right? So I pulled in, and I... And a, and a guy and a, and a woman came out, and I showed them the guitar, told them the story, and they got this big book out, and we're all paging through the books, looking for the, you know, something that looks like this, and for sure it wasn't a Thunderbird, and we couldn't figure out what it was. So the woman says, let's go inside. Harold will know. So we walked inside, and there's Harold. He's sitting on a big easy chair, looked like a throne or something, you know? And he was a real big heavy guy. Looked like he hadn't moved in a couple weeks or something. And he had everything he needed to live within arm's reach. He could, just everything was piled around him. And I sat and talked with him for a long time. They were, they were tickled that I stopped and you know, they, they were really excited about just seeing somebody, I think. But anyway, um, we were all talking, and finally he, he goes, honey, get my camera. He took some pictures, and then the moment came where he was gonna identify the guitar, right? He says, give it to me. So he took it, and he's looking at it like this, and he goes. Rambler, 1953. <laughs> 
Can you tell the difference between this style and the Piedmont style that I played earlier? This one's a lot, this kind of stuff is more like Delta Blues. It's a lot more guttural, a lot of kind of heavy groove, a little more dark sounding, if you will. This guy is what we now call the king of the Delta Blues, Robert Johnson. And these guys, in the last uh, photo and, and Robert Johnson, guys like this were rock stars back then because no, like I said, nobody could travel, right? But these guys were able to travel from place to place and play at these barrel houses, sometimes go to different states and they were just revered. Robert Johnson, actually when he first started out, he was following around these other guys, Sun House, Willie Brown, and uh, he would follow them around and come to their shows and, uh, and they thought he was a nuisance. You know, they didn't want to deal with him, some little kid, you know, get out of here. Well, Robert Johnson went away for about two years. They didn't see him. Nobody knew where he was or anything. Finally, he came back, and he had remarkably become so proficient at playing the guitar that no one could believe it. And the legend grew up, and I don't know if he started it or somebody else did, but, but uh, the legend grew up that he got so good because he went to the crossroads and he sold his soul to the devil. I tried it, it didn't work. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, I'm standing at the crossroad. Lord, I'm trying to flag a ride. shows the different regions of Mississippi again you can see the Delta um, the Appalachian foothills is what I earlier called the hill country there's a there's a little town up there called Tupelo have you ever heard of that before some famous guy was from Tupelo do you know what I'm talking about Elvis Presley, Elvis Presley yeah who's from Tupelo tell a little story about him later but anyway so in that hill country area there was another style that uh, evolved and the characteristic of this style was just that the guys would come up with some lick, a lick and they would just play it like over and over and over and over again until it became kind of hypnotic and almost trance like and uh, this guy I actually saw him play in the 70s he came to Penn State and I went to see him play he was a great guy his name was Mississippi Fred McDowell from the hill country he was one of the early hill country players but he had, a, he had a habit, when I saw him a couple times, and every time he would play, he would come down, sit in front of the audience, he would sit, and he would look out, and he would say, I don't play no rock and roll. That's how he started every show. I don't play no rock and roll. I think the Rolling Stones recorded a couple of his numbers, and, and maybe people were relating to that, and play some rock and roll, I don't know. 
but he would start every show. I don't play no rock and roll. I play blues and specials. Blues and special songs. <laughs> In the 70s, he started touring around. A lot of these guys got so-called rediscovered, and they were touring some of the colleges, and that's when I got to see him play. But that young lady next to him, did anybody recognize her? Bonnie, Bonnie Ray. yeah. She was just in, I don't know, she was about 20 years old, I think. I heard that she went to Radcliffe in, you know, in Boston. And he used to come up there to play in Cambridge, and they got to know each other. And uh, so she toured with him a bunch. And when she plays her slide guitar, which you hear, a lot of it's stuff that uh, you can hear the Mississippi Fred McCall influence. Here's a song off of one of her early albums that Fred recorded. It's called the Kokomo Blues. When you come home, baby. Conditions were so horrible in the South that millions of people uh, migrated north. Some of them went to Chicago. Gary Davis, he went to New York. But a lot of the guys from the Delta ended up in Chicago. There were factories there and jobs. And though it was, uh, conditions were still pretty harsh, it was better than what they were experiencing in the, in the Delta. So the next town up the river on the way north, pretty much the big town was Memphis. And a lot of guys congregated there. This is Beale Street. I actually got to play on Beale Street three or four times. And uh, man, what a great place. You can see B.B. King's Blues Club on the right there. It's at the top of the hill. And all these historic clubs uh, that were really rocking back in the day. And characters like B.B. King would show up there. And also in Memphis, we mentioned him before, this guy. Elvis Presley. You know, he became uh, famous in a sense because he was singing a lot of, in the early days, singing a lot of the old black blues songs. And uh, he was accepted on, on the radio because he was white. He sounded black, though. And the people that would hear him, they would say, that's a, that's a black guy. But he was actually white, so he was actually uh, able to, you know, he was accepted in certain circles. He recorded his first song at the Sun Studios in Memphis, which I got to visit. In fact, this microphone is the exact same kind of microphone he used back in those days. And uh, he recorded at the Sun Studios. In the day, you could go into Sun Studios, and Sam Phillips was the owner. He, he, he owned it. And he had a deal. You could uh, come in, and if you paid him $5, you could record whatever song you wanted, and he could make a disc right there and give it to you. Well, Elvis came in, and he recorded his first song. You know what it was? Happy Birthday. He recorded Happy Birthday for his mother as a birthday present. And uh, Sam Phillips said, well, that's, that's great. Do you, do you know any other songs? <laughs> 
and he ripped into this one, which is a song he learned back in Tupelo from one of the blues guys, Arthur Big Boy Crudup. He, Elvis used to sneak out at night and uh, go down to the back alleys where the blues guys were playing, and that's a big influence on him. Here's the one that became a hit. He recorded at Sun Studios, and Sam Phillips immediately sent it to the local DJ who started playing it. The phones ran off the hook, and the rest is history. That's all right, Mama. That's all right for you. That's all right, Mama. Any way you do, baby, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, Mama. Well, any way you do. Well, Mama, she done told me. Papa done told me too. Son, that girl, you're full of wish. You ain't no good for you, baby. That's all right. That's all right. Well, that's all right now, Mama. It's all right now, Mama. Well, any way you do. Well, that's all right now, Mama. Well, any way you do. <laughs> Arthur Big Boy Cook. Have you seen the Elvis movie? Fantastic, you gotta see it. Really explains a lot about his early days where he got his influence. He was also into gospel and he used to uh, go to the Pentecostal churches down there in the area and in the movie, and I, I guess it's true, but that's where he got all his shaking and stuff, you know, when he would get all jived up and he'd start jumping around. But anyway, all right, the next stop north is Chicago. There you go. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. A kid showed me how to do that. <laughs> I never would have figured it out. Here it is. Chicago. And one of the guys that moved up to Chicago as part of the Great Migration was this guy, Muddy Waters. The Great Muddy Waters. You've heard of him, right? Oh, yeah. oh my God. And then on the left, there he is in the early days. Uh, in the middle, there's a picture of his uh, cabin uh, in Mississippi lived on a plantation, and on the right was his house in Chicago, which you could tell is a big upgrade. <laughs> uh, still not too fancy, but way better than what he had before. Buddy Waters was amazing. He was one of the first guys, well, along with B.B. King, that uh, started playing electric guitar, and he put all his blues that he learned in the Delta, and like I say, he used to play cigar box guitar and everything, and he started playing electric, and man, what a, what a great change that was. In fact, he was became real popular and uh, he was hanging out with guys like this. You recognize that guy on the left? Mick Jagger. Uh, I'm mentioning this because the roots of rock and roll are really the blues. In fact, Elvis, uh, the Rolling Stones, guys like uh, uh, Eric Clapton, a lot of those British guys uh, were really their first bunch of albums were just covers of old blues songs. And uh, Muddy used to say, because his, his career was kind of in a slump when he met the Stones, or, and the Stones recorded a couple of his songs, as they also did for Mississippi Fred McDowell and a couple of the other guys. And Muddy used to say, all of a sudden, he, he was well known. He would tour with the Stones. He would open the show to big, big audiences. And Muddy used to say, them's be boys. <laughs> you know, he, he brought him back into prominence. Well, here's a good old Muddy Waters song. Let's see. Switch guitars again. Um, yeah, those were the days. The Stones, that, that picture is from, what was it? I think it was called the Checkerboard Lounge in Chicago. Where they they got those pictures and they filmed that, but uh, that's where they got a lot of their stuff. Gypsy 
mother told my mom Before I was born Gonna be a man child, come with baby Gonna be a son of a god Gonna tell the pretty women Just jump and shout Gonna tell the world now baby what it's all about John the Conqueror, baby, well, I'm gonna mess with you, I'm gonna take your pretty girl, lead you by the hand, well, now the world's gonna know I'm a hoochie-coochie man, sit down. So same thing with Fleetwood Mac, just a blues band in the beginning. Uh, Eric Clapton I mentioned, and all those British guys. It was called the British Invasion back then. But anyway, we're going to move, take another move again from Chicago, and this time we're going to go all the way over to the Northeast, because kind of in the '60s, mostly when the kind of when the British Invasion was happening, there was a thing called the the, uh, you know, that folk movement that was going on in Greenwich Village, and they were rediscovering all these guys from the South that had played, and, and there was a, an interest in the music again. A lot of the old blues men were being so-called rediscovered, and they were, they were happy about that because all of a sudden they were touring all over the country and even in Europe, all over the place. And uh, there was a center for activity and Washington, D.C., where my guitar teacher, the original one, was from D.C., and he got steeped in that tradition, which is where I got a lot of my stuff and was influenced by him. Uh, New York City, of course, Greenwich Village, uh, Boston, Cambridge had a big scene, Philadelphia had a big folk scene at that time. This guy here was from Boston. I think it was in the 90s when I first started playing out professionally full-time, uh, somebody said, well, you like blues, you got to meet this guy from Boston, Paul Rochelle. Paul taught me how to play slide and uh, a, lot of other, a lot of stuff about the old Piedmont, the country blues, uh, Delta stuff. He taught me all of that stuff. There's him playing a resophonic guitar, a real special one made by the National Company. And, but the funny thing about Paul, or the great thing, was... Um, he got to hang out with a lot of these old blues guys when they were touring and they would stop in, in Cambridge. Uh, the story was the promoter that brought him into town called Paul up because he knew he was into the music, this kind of music, and he would have Paul essentially babysit uh, these blues guys that would come through. He met Son House, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, John Lee Hooker, all of these guys played there, and Paul, during the day, would hang out with them uh, to, just to make sure that they got to the show and they were in good shape and all that stuff. Uh, some of them really liked to drink, you know, so that was part of it. You got Some of them you could get them something or, or make sure they didn't get something one way or the other. Uh, but anyway, he would show up uh, to these shows and, and the great thing was he would be hanging out and get them to tell all the stories, you know. So he got to know Sun House and all these people and then I got to hear the, some of the stories as a result of of him. This guy here, you may know, Dave Van Ronk. Ever heard of him? Yeah. From New York City. Well, I got to take lessons from Dave 
in the late 90s, which was fantastic. I met somebody, I was playing in the Berkshires, and somebody said, oh, you ever think about taking lessons from Dave Van Ronk? And I said, no, are you kidding me? How, you know, how can you take lessons from Dave Van Ronk? To me, he was a god, you know. And they said, well, he's giving lessons. I don't know, I, I have his, his wife as my cousin or something, and here's his phone number. So I called him up one day, and uh, nothing, just left a message. Week went by, maybe two weeks, I don't know how long, and all of a sudden the phone rings one day, and I pick it up, and he says, Hello, this is Dave Van Romp. <laughs> he had a real gravelly voice, if you recall. And I said, Oh my God, Dave Van Romp. Well, we set up lessons, and I went down there for about two years. I would take the train down to New York, subway, get over to the Sheridan Square area, if you're in Greenwich Village, if you're familiar, and go to his apartment and sit there and take lessons from him. Uh, one of my, my first lesson uh, was just me learning his method of uh, musical notation, which guitar players know called tablature. It's not with regular notes, it's more of a graphic, uh, graphic way, I won't explain it, but anyway, he had a, a certain kind of tablature and he gave me the song, ready? Freight Train. But his tablature was so kind of hard to figure out that he just explained the tablature and he said, now, here, play this. Come on back next week. I already knew the song, right? But there were a couple little glitches in it that you would only know if you really got the tablature right. So I worked really hard all week. I just, I go, man, I gotta get this right. Get on to New York the next week, and I he said, go ahead, play it. So I played the song, and he looks up and he says, maybe this isn't going to be so bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> i got to tell one other quick Dave Van Ronk story. Uh, you know, he taught me all kinds of stuff about guitar. He, he was a big uh, student and fan of Reverend Gary Davis, who was a very complex guitar player, a lot of stuff up the neck. And Dave was really fond of that. He was really into early jazz and guys like Jelly Roll Morton. And he would transcribe these very complex pieces for guitar. Um, but anyway, taught me all that stuff. But one, one day I'm with him and I, I said, Dave, you're teaching me so much about the guitar, but what about the voice? Can you teach me anything about that? And he says, yeah. He says, what, what you need to do is more of this. Wah! Roar! Ah! Like that. He said, wow. Dave, is, isn't that bad for your voice? And he said, no, it's good for your voice. <laughs> one of his early songs that I learned. Actually, the guy, my first guitar teacher, taught me this song, one of my early songs that I learned how to play, actually. Long, long trip. 
train Wayne and Janelle Come and took my baby Far away from here Hey, come back, baby Let's talk it over, baby, one more time Let's talk it over Baby, one more time Yeah, that, that Greenwich Village scene in the day was fantastic, of course. You're probably aware of all the people that were, were there at the time, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Bob Dylan, all those early folk guys. In fact, Dave told me the story. I, I used to love to pump them for stories. We would do the lesson, and then I'd try to get them talking, you know, so I could stay a little extra, and he would start on his stories. And he had a lot of stories about Bob Dylan. In fact, in the early days, he said Bob Dylan... When he first came to town, he slept on Dave's couch. And uh, they called Dave back in those guys, in, in those times, the mayor of McDougal Street, McDougal Street in the village. He was kind of one of the kingpins of the scene. And he ran a couple of the clubs or booked the clubs and ran some of these coffee houses as the host. And so he was, he was the guy you wanted to get to know if you wanted to come to New York and play. Um, that, that uh, sorry, that... That picture on the right is from Bob Dylan's free Bob Dylan's freewheeling album, one of his early albums. And that woman he's with is was his girlfriend at the time, and that's taken picture taken in the village. Her name was Susie Rotolo, and I actually got to meet her one time. That was kind of cool. I never met Dylan, of course, but met Susie Rotolo. So Here's a song Dave taught me. It's an old Bessie Smith song. If I take a notion to jump into the ocean, ain't nobody business if I do. If I go to church on Sunday, go out on the town and raise a hell on Monday, ain't nobody business, baby, if I do, well, ain't nobody business, baby, how in the world I find my grave, ain't nobody business, kid, how in the world I do my business with, well, what you wanna just mess with me for, baby? Let me drink my wine. Yeah. Well, it ain't nobody business, baby. If I do, ain't nobody business, baby. How in the world I find my gravy? Ain't nobody business, kid. How in the world I do my business with? Well, now what you wanna mess with me? Well, ain't nobody business, baby. Ain't nobody business. Ain't nobody dirty business. Ain't nobody business, baby. Ain't nobody business if I do. Kind of comes full circle, you know. Um, the uh, the way the blues traveled around and migrated Britain back, you know, the whole thing. And uh, and Dave was a big part of that. He called it the folk scare in the '60s. And uh, so he was playing, bringing back a lot of these songs that guys like Blind Boy Fuller and and uh, Blind Blake, all those guys were playing in the old days. He was playing them and bringing them to new audiences. Met a girl at the cabaret Pretty pop will go my way Got drunk was my fault I'm drinking tequila Leaving the salt 
Met a girl with a big bank coat. Fancy car a 40 foot boat. She pulled a gun and she took my dog. Getting hard and it didn't get so. That'll never happen no more. That'll never happen no more. To wear my overalls. I drunk it with my fault. Now I drink in tequila, leave the salt. Met a girl with a big big coat, big fancy car, forty foot boat. Pulled the gun, she took my dough. In the hall, I didn't get so. Well, that'll never happen no more. That'll never happen no more. anything about the scene that was going on in Texas. You know, we could get into all of this stuff, the Chicago blues, more about the Delta. All of these things are very rich topics for exploration, even the, the way the British guys came over and, and brought the music back to this country. Really fantastic. But what about the future of the blues? Well, there's a lot of modern players that, that came out. Stevie Ray Vaughan is one of them you probably heard of. Now there's a guy named Joe Bonamassa. There's a whole bunch of kind of new artists playing modern blues. Keb Mo, you may have heard of. I mean, there's a bunch of them. But here's something, uh, here's the future of the blues for me. Uh, we have a little place in Old Lyme, Connecticut, where I'm from. I came from there today. And uh, it's a little kind of a coffee shop called Nightingale's, Nightingale's Acoustic Cafe. It's a nonprofit. And we have shows there every Saturday, every Tuesday, we have a picking party stuff like that, but we try to work as much as we can with, with young kids. Um, here's a couple of our kids that have really been doing great. They started out, a lot of the kids say we, we had our first show at Nightingale's. And uh, just, a, just an opportunity for them to get out and play, be with other kids and explore things is really wonderful. But uh, the, the uh, group on the, the picture on the upper left is from our diddly bow workshop we did we we built i made some kits and stuff and we assembled these diddly bows made them out of a, a stick and uh, an altoids tin and there's a bent over quarter that we used for the bridge and I taught these kids how to play the diddly bow uh, the woman or the young girl on the right and the top is named sophia griswold she came to our picking party a couple months after she got her first guitar and just blew everybody away and just started getting real good. Now she's at Berkeley College of Music and one of the things she's done among many other things, uh, and she's still in school, she uh, applied and was accepted to be part of the pop band that was the featured band at the World's Fair in Dubai. Mm -hmm. She went to Dubai for six months and uh, they put her up over there and she was part of their, you know, their, their, their showpiece pop band. There were kids from all over the world. There was a guy from, I think it was Brazil that was a singer. They, his name was Nacho. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cuban guys were playing the drums, you know, and uh, just amazing stuff. But uh, she has some great videos from that experience. She's back in school now. But um, the kid on the right and at the top and then right below that named Braden Sunshine, he was 14 years old when he first played at Nightingale's Cafe, and that picture from the bottom was when he uh, was a finalist on the show The Voice. Have you ever heard of that? No. American Idol, The Voice. So he applied and made it through all the trials, and he made it to, I think, number nine on The Voice. We were so excited about that. This kid on the bottom uh, in the middle named Jake Kulak, 
he's down in New York City now, living in Brooklyn, playing blues, doing great. And this, these young girls on the left are a, a group of uh, local girls that write original music, and they're into country music, and they've already been to Nashville and all this stuff, so we're really excited to be a part of, uh, of these kids and, and their development. So, I'm gonna conclude my program, and thanks for coming, with an original song. And uh, it's one that I wrote about my early days. I did a lot of in the early days, was kind of influenced by Woody Guthrie a lot. And all I wanted to do was hitchhike and hop freight trains, <laughs> which I did. Hitchhiked all over the country and hopped a couple freight trains and got to see the whole United States. Really fantastic. But I wrote this song about my early, early life called Ramblin'. When I was a young man Hopped a couple of freight trains Just to see this land I started rambling I started rambling baby. I'm like a dog that don't remember his name I never play the game Can't tell my future I don't want to know Some of these feelings, baby, they won't let go, that's why I'm rambling I'm just rambling, baby And I got rambling on my month I'm at Harry's Hardware and Cabot and the Morgan Country Store and where else am I playing up here I played all over Burlington I was Burlington first night and some of the clubs Nectars and all those places so I come up once in a while so uh, sign up and you can uh, follow me around <laughs> thanks for coming everybody Thank you.